Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the story of Muriel and Alec McKay. Muriel and Alec were both born in Adelaide, Australia. They met in school and went on to marry and have three children together, a son by the name of Ian and two daughters called Jennifer and Diane. They were a successful and happy family. Alec was a newspaper executive and in the 1950s they relocated from Australia to London, England. In the late 1960s, the media tycoon Rupert Murdoch had acquired his first British newspaper, The News of the World, followed shortly afterwards by the daily newspaper, The Sun. These tabloid papers were notorious for publishing personal and sensationalist stories and despite being heavily criticised by many, were extremely popular with very high circulation numbers. In 1969, Alec was working alongside Rupert Murdoch at his media empire. Alec and Muriel were living in St Mary's house on Arthur Road in Wimbledon. It was just down the road from the tennis club. Their beautiful Georgian style house was on a quiet street in an exclusive area of the capital city. In September that year, their home had been burgled and several items of jewellery had been taken. Muriel, in particular, had been quite distressed by this and the couple had installed some extra security features at their home. That December, Rupert and his then-wife Anna were holidaying in Australia over the Christmas period. Rupert left Alec as acting chairman during his absence and with this role came the use of Rupert's chauffeur-driven Rolls-Royce. On Monday 29th of December 1969, Alec returned home from work at approximately 7.45pm. Rather than letting himself into the house, he rang the front doorbell as, since the earlier burglary, Muriel had been keeping the front door locked with a security chain fastened from the inside. After receiving no answer, Alec rang the bell a couple more times before trying to open the front door. He was surprised to find it unlocked. When he went inside, he found that the house was empty and immediately realised that something terrible had happened. The telephone had been torn off of the wall, a chair was overturned in the hallway and the contents of his wife's handbag were scattered nearby. The couple's pet Dachshund was in the house, anxious but unharmed. At 8pm, Alec alerted the police who arrived shortly afterwards. Several items were found in the house, twine, adhesive tape, a copy of People newspaper and a bill hook, a traditional cutting tool most commonly used to cut things like shrubs and branches. It was also noticed that around £600 worth of jewellery had been stolen, around £10,000 or US dollars in today's values. Around five hours later, at 1am on the 30th of December, the phone rang at the house. A man identified himself as M3 and said that he had taken Muriel. He informed the family that he had wanted to kidnap Robert Murdoch's wife, Anna, but had taken Muriel instead. M3 demanded a ransom of £1 million, it's the equivalent of about £16 million or $20 million today. He told the family that they had until Wednesday evening to get the money together. Alec told the kidnapper that he did not have that kind of money and there was no way he could pay it. He simply wasn't that rich. The kidnapper said that he knew Alec had rich friends so he should find a way otherwise Muriel would die. A massive police search operation involving over 120 officers was soon underway. Statements were taken from neighbours and police dogs used to try to find further clues. Despite initially demanding that the ransom money was due on Wednesday the 31st of December, no details of the exchange were given. On the morning of the 31st, the family received a letter at their home which appeared to have been written by Muriel whilst blindfolded. In the letter she implored the family to do what the kidnapper asked so that she could come home. Once again, it provided no details of how or when to pay the ransom. Alec was determined that the kidnapping should remain in the public eye and gave details of this letter to his newspaper to publish. 
This also appeared on the news channels to make a public appeal to the kidnapper. The police started to receive more ransom demands and hoax calls. Questions were raised as to whether the kidnapping was linked to the intrusive and controversial nature of the reporting at the papers which Alec helped run. The police investigation continued. The FBI were consulted and the family even went so far as to get a famous Dutch clairvoyant involved. The police became convinced that the kidnapping had been carried out by an amateur due to the lack of any coherent demands. Finally, on 1st of February 1970, over a month after the kidnapping, M3 called and gave explicit instructions for the ransom drop. M3 stated that Muriel and Alex's son Ian should deliver half of the ransom money to a specific crossroad on the A10 north of London. The spot at the crossroads would be identified by paper flowers. Deciding that it was too dangerous for Ian to complete the money drop, he was replaced by a detective sergeant, along with a police inspector who took the place of his driver. The drop was made, but due to the obvious police presence in the area, was not collected. Alec made another public appeal to the kidnapper, saying that he would do whatever was necessary to bring his wife home. M3 again made contact stating that Alec and his daughter Diane should put half a million pounds into two suitcases and then follow his exact instructions to make the drop. Once again it was decided that making the drop was too dangerous and police officers took the place of Alec and Diane. The officers were directed to various telephone boxes before being told to get on a tube and travel to Epping. Once they arrived at Epping Station, they were directed to another telephone box where they had to wait for another call. During this call, they were directed to take a taxi to Bishop Stortford, where they were instructed to leave the ransom money near the forecourt of a garage. The suitcases containing half a million pounds, the majority of which were fake notes, were left by the side of the road. A passing couple noticed the suitcases being abandoned and thought that something suspicious was happening. They contacted the local police, who were unaware of the kidnapping investigation, who promptly arrived and took the suitcases to the nearby police station. Any cars seen in the area had been locked prior to the local police retrieving the suitcases. It was noted that a dark blue Volvo had been seen passing the area several times. When this car log was reviewed in line with the details from the previous aborted drop-off attempt and witness statements from the day that Muriel was kidnapped, it was found that a dark colour Volvo had been seen every time. The police traced the owner of the car. It was registered to 34-year-old Arthur Hussein. He lived at a livestock farm in Stocking Pelham, a small village in Hertfordshire. Arthur was originally from Trinidad and had moved to England 15 years earlier. He lived at the farm with his wife Elsa, their children and his youngest brother, 22-year-old Nizamuddin. Nizamuddin had arrived in the UK a few months earlier. Despite having no farming experience, Arthur had borrowed heavily to buy the farm the previous year. The police believed that this could finally be the break in the case that they were looking for and raided the 11-acre farm at 8am on the morning of 7th of February. As the police searched the farmhouse, they uncovered an overwhelming amount of evidence against the brothers. They found twine and tape matching that found at the McKay's house, paper flowers which matched those used to mark the first drop-off spot along with a notebook with torn out pages that exactly matched the pages on which Muriel's letter to her family had been written. They also found a sawn off shotgun at the time. Further fingerprint evidence linked Arthur to the cigarette packet in the Epping phone box, the ransom letters and the newspaper found at Muriel's house. Visually, Arthur and Nizamuddin matched the description of the two men seen in the Volvo and Nizamuddin's voice matched those on the recordings of the telephone calls to the family. With the mass of evidence against Arthur and Nizamuddin, they were arrested and charged with kidnapping and blackmail. However, there was still no trace of Muriel 
An extensive search of the 11-acre farm was concluded over the following few weeks, but nothing could be found that proved Muriel had been present there. In the weeks between the kidnapping and search, it was assumed that any evidence may have been washed away by the English winter. Muriel was presumed dead, and both men were additionally charged with her murder. The case went to trial on Monday the 14th of September 1970. Whilst Arthur seemed to enjoy the attention, Nizamuddin became extremely withdrawn and attempted to take his own life on two separate occasions. During the trial, the financial difficulties of the pair were fully revealed and it was established that on the 30th of October 1969, the two brothers saw a television interview with Rupert Murdoch during which he discussed his recent multi-million pound purchase of The Sun and the News of the World. The brothers then came up with a plan to kidnap Rupert's wife, Anna, and make some quick money. That December, Elsa and the children had returned to Germany for their Christmas holidays, and the brothers then decided to put their plan into action. They followed Rupert's Rolls Royce to the Mackay house on Arthur Street, believing it to be the home of the Murdochs, and made plans to return to complete the kidnapping. As the trial progressed, both brothers denied any involvement and each tried to blame each other. The jury of nine men and three women deliberated for just over four hours before finding Arthur and Nizamuddin guilty of all the charges that had been brought against them. On 6th of October 1970, they were both sentenced to life in prison for Muriel's murder plus additional years for the kidnapping and blackmailing charges. Summing up, the judge turned to the two men and stated, Your conduct was cold-blooded and abominable. She was snatched from the security and comfort of her own home and reduced to terror and despair. Her murder was one of the UK's earliest cases of a guilty conviction where no body was ever found. Arthur applied for parole in November 1987 and September 1994. This was denied on both occasions. He died in prison in 2009. Nizam Medin served 20 years in prison and was released in 1990. He was immediately deported back to Trinidad. Alec McKay died of a heart attack in January 1983. He was 73 years old. It has never been established exactly what happened to Muriel after she was taken from her home although it is most commonly believed that she was brutally murdered soon after being kidnapped and her body fed to the pigs on the farm. That concludes today's story of Muriel McKay. Thanks very much for listening to that. Please add any comments down below. As ever, I'll be interested in reading them and seeing what you have to say on this case. And now it's time for petty crime. Nicolina has kindly sent in some beautiful photos of her pets. First up we have Chester, who is an incredibly spoiled English cream golden retriever. Chester was fed from a table when he was a puppy and now he doesn't eat from his bowl. We also have three cats. First up we have Snuggles, who's a total diva. She'll only eat the fish she's in the mood for. Then we have a tuxedo cat called Miki. Doesn't like Snuggles, they can't share the same room. One in, one out. And finally we have the king. His name is Fliffy, F-L-I-F-F-Y. He was a rescue cat found in a garage where the previous owners had declawed him. He's very much the boss and the other two don't feature in his life. They normally live in Barclay, just outside San Francisco, and sometimes live in Southern California. Thanks very much for sharing them, Nicolina. Now, we've got a master criminal guinea pig. Sam has kindly sent in a picture of her beautiful bandit. Bandit has other nicknames though, believe it or not, such as Bumble Pig, Fat Lad, Lard and In Charge, and finally, Porker Pillar. He's a good guinea pig, enjoys his food, and Bandit's partner in crime is Patch, a quiet and typically camera shy piggy, but Sam put out some dandelion and before you know it, we've got a picture of Patch. Believe it or not, Patch is known to sneak the food off of Bandit. Thanks very much for listening to the Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. My question today is, at what age did you realize the phrase Damn it, I'm mad. Spelt exactly the same backwards. 
please feel free to lie about your age. I'm going to. Goodbye.